This is five on your side at six, focused on you. Today marks 10 years since the death of Michael Brown. The community held events in the Ferguson area marking the day, including a unity walk and a moment of silence. Thanks for joining us. I'm Kelly Jackson. And I'm Ann Allred. Brown was shot and killed in 2014 by a Ferguson police officer. Thousands gathered today to remember Brown. Our Megan Kernett joins us in studio with reaction from the community. Well, every year on the day Michael Brown Jr. was killed, the community holds a memorial service and unity walk. But a decade later, the messages many shared were about how to make change in the community. Brown's family, including his dad, Michael Brown Sr., led a unity walk to remember his life and the global movement it launched. It started at Normandy High School as thousands of activists and community members marched and chanted Brown's name. The march ended as hundreds of blue roses lined Canfield Drive, the street where his body lay for hours. It was followed by almost four minutes of silence and a memorial service. Brown was the oldest of 11 siblings. We spoke to many of them who wish he was here to see them grow up. Sad that he didn't get to live longer. I got to do a lot of first that my brother wasn't able to be at. I know that he's still here watch, watching over us and protecting us no matter what. That's when I'm gonna stand up, take my people with me. Together we are going to a brand new home. Now, Brown sister, who you just heard sing beautifully, will be singing tonight at the Black Ball Fundraising Gala at the Missouri History Museum. That's from starting now at 6, and it lasts until 10.30 p.m. On Saturday, there will be a Heal Our Cities concert at Harris So State University from noon to 3. The city of Delwood took the brunt of the damage during the unrest following a grand jury's decision not to prosecute the officer who killed Michael Brown. Countless businesses were damaged or destroyed along West Florissance. Today, the Urban League broke ground on an $8.5 million shopping center there. It will include a first bank, restaurants, and a banquet hall and shops, and it could open by next summer. And one St. Louis organization celebrated its 10-year mark to coincide with the anniversary of Michael Brown's death. Story Stitchers. It uses art as an alternative for youth voices. Our Justina Cornell takes us to the Grand Center Arts District in St. Louis. Watching it happen and then looking at the aftermath, looking at the riots, definitely made me feel, especially as an artist, like I should say something. You know, I should say something. I shouldn't be quiet during a time like this. Brandon Lewis found his voice in a home. Following Michael Brown's death, many organizations were empowered to make change, including the nonprofit Story Stitchers. That played a lot in pushing us forward. Forward to today. We'll have a podcast discussion with a police officer and a therapist. A two-day youth empowerment summit honored the organization's work within the last 10 years and remembered Michael Brown's death, a key factor to their foundation. Lewis, as the youth artistic coordinator, made sure the anniversary played a role. When we were planning this event out, we were talking to about a group of 18 youth and we were kind of talking about the Mike Brown incident as if they knew what happened. We were kind of assuming that they were already aware. And so the, one of them was like, who was Mike Brown? And we were like, what? And then another one was like, I don't know who that is either. You know, you know, and so they kind of went around the table pretty much saying, we, yeah, we don't know what happened. We decided to take our knowledge portion to educate people on what happened. Mixing that vital information with the magic of music. A lot of people really underestimate how words have power. The youth recruitment and engagement specialist Amara Burns was 16 years old a decade ago. When Mike Brown died, it actually led me to create a poem. It was that poem that I performed for the first time when I came to Story Stitchers. This outlet became a plug for the pain. This full circle moment is a reminder. There's always a home for your voice. Biggest message is that you matter. You know, I think 16 year old me would appreciate the dedication and the hard work um, because this has actually been a goal to be able to foster the next generation and give back what was given to me. Justina Cornell, five on your side. 
About 45 teenagers signed up for today. Tomorrow, the organization plans to have an album release party along with an award ceremony. I sat down with Michael Brown's father. He says it has been his mission to help other grieving fathers and says his organization, Chosen for Change, helps them process their loss. I feel like uh, we should not be walking around on this earth um, as a ticking time bomb like that, dealing with things. We should be able to get help. So my program is basically uh, about trying to uh, heal, you know, uh, grieving fathers and um, teaching them tools to reinvent themselves. You can see much more of this interview in our special Race, Listen, Learn, Live, Voices of Ferguson. It's on August 22nd, August 22nd at 7 p.m. The hour-long special takes a closer look at how far Ferguson has come since that day, the healing that has taken place, and the work that still needs to be done. You can also find our full interview with Michael Brown Sr. along with Ferguson Mayor Ella Jones online. For a link, text the word Ferguson to 314-425-5355. Now to a developing story in Springfield, Illinois, where just hours ago, the Sagamon County Sheriff announced his retirement. This comes five weeks after the death of Sonia Massey in her home. She was shot and killed by Sagamon County Sheriff's Deputy Sean Grayson last month. Grayson is being held on first-degree murder charges, and a judge denied his release today. Sheriff Jack Campbell and his office have received criticism and death threats. He says he cannot continue to do his job effectively. Campbell says he will leave office by the end of the month. The St. Louis Public Schools District is under scrutiny after an audit reveals chronic issues with record keeping and financial mismanagement. Our senior investigative reporter Paula Vassan has combed through a mountain of documents exposing the serious implications these findings could have for the district and its leadership. Paula. Well, we went through 175 pages probing into the challenges within St. Louis Public Schools. It's the district's most recent audit and what it uncovers is concerning. As parents worry about transportation, we don't know anything um, and it's it's kind of weird. And St. Louis's mayor, Tashara Jones, demands transparency. Well, I think our parents and families deserve answers. The I-team fought to get answers, obtaining the school district's latest audit. Conducted by an independent consulting firm, it sheds light on long-standing problems with record keeping and financial processes. The district was obligated to submit the audit to the state by the end of last year, but missed the deadline by months. The delay prompted the state to temporarily withhold about $3.7 million in funding. The audit underscores issues with maintaining and reporting financial records. Experts tell us that while these findings stop short of indicating fraud, they raise serious questions about accountability within the district, problems often aggravated by high staff turnover. And yet another finding, gaps in staffing and oversight. In response, the district is required to draft a corrective action plan. Among the most significant steps, hiring a new director of real estate, a move that could carry major financial consequences. This all comes after Superintendent Keisha Scarlett has been placed on temporary leave. It comes amid a projected $35 million budget deficit, fueling concerns her leave may be connected to issues surrounding spending, hiring and bus transportation. And we reached out to St. Louis Public Schools for comment. As of our deadline, they have not responded. Industry sources say the responsibility for this financial and operational crisis rests on the school board. Coming up, a couple of high school football fields damaged by rain are in the fast track to get fixed. When the repairs will be completed and how much it will cost. Plus, the nonprofit gives away a million dollars worth of school supplies in just a couple of hours. This Paris weather update is sponsored by BJC Healthcare. You deserve extraordinary care. And before we get back to school, we got to get back to Paris and the Olympics tonight. For tomorrow, temperatures are going back into the mid 80s. The heat is building Sunday, low 90s and upper 90s by Monday afternoon. Of course, the Paralympics pick up going into next week. We'll see you with our forecast in just a few minutes.